Hello and welcome to the Emotion at Work podcast where we take a deep dive into the human condition. This is our first podcast of 2018, so happy new year or happy new year of listening to the podcast, depending on uh, when you're actually listening to this episode, because it might not necessarily be uh, in early January 2018. So I I got to thinking about how should I set up the new year, because um, this is the first new episode that's been recorded for a while. The last um, new content that came out was with the podcast with Dawn Archer, and then we've done a couple of rebroadcasts since then. So it feels like I've been off the air for a couple of months, really. And I wanted to to start the new year as I finished the old one with um, with my own reflections and, and setting out or my own reflections and, and sharing some experiences and then setting out what you can expect from the Emotion at Work podcast over 2018. Um, but I'm going to start with uh, I'm going to start with a story and, and I'm going to start with the story of, of my 2017, really. And. Is, I find this reflection, this particular reflection, quite interesting because emotion is something that I study in other people, that I research as part of my, uh, as part of my work. It's something that I um, engage with in in the coaching work that I do and in the the consulting and the um, the deception research that I get involved with, the deception research and practice that I get involved in, and and yet. 2017 was a hugely emotional year for me um, and I talk about how emotion affects individuals but it also affects relationships and then it, it goes on to impact um, teams, organisations and cultures as well and for me this year has been really really interesting from a personal perspective in the the interaction between emotion and identity. So we as as humans build identities for ourselves and and those identities are made up of of lots of different aspects or facets and one of the things that i really struggled with last year was that the the version of me that i was having to be didn't feel like me now i've had that in the past but that was more kind of forced upon me in the context that i was in I, i was told i had to behave in a particular way so i did that and if um, if you want to know more about that, I'll put the link to that experience. Uh, there's a video that I've done for that. I'll put I'll put a link to that experience in, um, uh, in the show notes. But 2017 was almost like this. This new identity was forced upon me that I couldn't be the me that I wanted to be, and and that was for a couple of different things. It was through physical illness, um, and through through some chronic pain. So. I had a, a, a debilitating health issue over the course of, of last year. The reason the podcast was off the air for a couple of months was because I had some surgery to, to get that issue fixed. But the um, one of the biggest challenges I faced both in the it, when I before the operation and then post op, uh, but in slightly different ways, and I'll come back to that in a minute, was the the emotional challenges that that then brought for me, and how I felt like I lost aspects or parts of who I was and and there was one um, bit in particular two bits in particular that, that really stick out in my memory and one of those is walking through the city of London now because a lot of the offices in, in the city have got glass in them when I was walking along the street I was able to see my reflection and I physically stopped at one point to look at who was walking in that glass because it just did not look like me or not the me that I knew anyway so I've seen myself walking in reflections in the city for years I've worked in and around the city for the last decade if not longer and so but there was a point this year where I was walking along and I just didn't know who I saw the way they were walking their gait their posture how how they were holding themselves just just didn't look like me and and it caught me really physically and viscerally and and it really made it um it really drove home to me how much what was happening to me physically was affecting me because in my head 
I was able to kind of push it or not able because that's a lie that, that's not true in my head I was working really hard to push the pain away and to push the impact it was having on me away and yet when I saw that reflection in the in the glass of the building it almost I don't know whether you know the end the metaphor could be drove home or woke me up or pulled me out but it, it demonstrated for me just how different I was to to the me that I thought I knew um and and that was the same thing that was happening for me from an uh, from an emotional and a, I guess in a way psychological point of view in that because I wasn't able to um, do the activities that I normally do. Um, so I'm, I love running. Uh, running is um, my third space, as, Suk, as at Sukpabia I would call it. Running is the, is the place I go where it, I, I'm, I'm just away from everything. And, and it's just me and my running. And if, if, if appropriate for that particular run, it's me and my competition against myself or against, my, against the times that I run or the speed that I can run at um, and and I lost that and I tried to find it in swimming and it just didn't work in the same way for me um, whether that's because of the physical surroundings um, or the action the activity itself I'm, I'm not sure but um, I, I felt like I was losing kind of core bits of who I was or core activities that made me who I was and and I find that really tricky um and and tricky is uh is is an underestimation i'm now pondering why i chose the word tricky but um because i think actually that's an underestimation of what it was it was <clears throat> yeah it was something that um i didn't expect to happen um i didn't want to happen and actually what then my, one of my coping strategies was just to avoid it really avoid it at all costs there was uh, there was a, a gig I was helping co-facilitate in Manchester and there was a pane of glass at the back of the room and I explained to my co-facilitator that I didn't like the look of my reflection in the glass and so um, she kindly placed a, a piece of flip chat paper over the glass so I wouldn't have to see myself when I was stood at the front of the room um, because I didn't like what I saw and and so what I was trying to do in a number of different ways was hide away from it. Um, I started to hide away in, in movies, in box sets, in podcasts, in listening to podcasts. Um, but my my kind of strategy was to uh, was to just yeah avoid it really and, and not want it to happen. And then I got to a point and, and again I wrote a blog on this one, so I'll put the link to the blog in the uh, in the show notes. I got to a point where I, I just felt like the um, the emotion was just there. It was it was at the what's called the suprasternal notch, which is the the little 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 what does that come from? Little uh, dip sort of at the top of your breastplate uh, and before your throat, and I could almost just feel the emotion there waiting to to pour out. Um, and it would show up sometimes. Sometimes there would be that that, that outflow or, or outburst of emotion, which would manifest its way in either frustration or tears, or, or sometimes a, a mix of the two. Um, and and that blog in particular, I found very cathartic. Um, it was almost a way of letting it it flood out without it being, um, without it taking over me. So it was a and and because I wrote that blog in the first person as well again i find that really helpful i i i find um put talking as if i were those feelings as a way of of helping me work with um with those emotions and and both of the things that i've talked about there both the the avoiding and uh, and trying to hide it away and the re the reframing are two common emotion management strategies um and and i'll again i'll put some link to some in the show notes to some work by um by a man called james gross into um emotion regulation he talks about five uh, predominant emotion regulation strategies that individuals use um and and for me the 
the reframing of, of, of talking in the first person as if I was the emotion I found really helpful, but also um, the other coping strategy that I used was to, to hide it, uh, was to avoid it and, and not give it any attention, just to to, to deploy my attention in, in a different way, which just ignored this this set of feelings that were that were happening over here. Um, and, and as a practitioner, I, I guess I find I, I, I look back now and I find it really interesting almost doing like some meta analysis point of view of analyze, reflecting on and then analyzing my own responses to the emotional challenges that I had last year. Um, because I find I find I had to work really, really hard last year. Um, especially to find joy or so there's the, for me there's like a distinction between there's there's the momentary emotion of happiness so that moment where something makes you laugh or um, you see something that you really like or you see someone that you really love um, or you you do you do a particular thing that makes you happy there and then in that moment so there's like that that momentary happiness but then there's a, a a broader kind of state of contentment, and I've 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 been quite lucky, I guess, in that that I've I find that traditionally I find that quite easy to do, to or quite common for me. That's me. That's a better phrase. I find it quite common for me to be able to find that state of contentment, to be happy with my lot to be to, to know that yeah life isn't perfect life isn't great all the time there are issues and tribulations and challenges and trials you know the the classic running your own business there are some times where you don't know where where the next month's uh, money is going to come from but actually in time in, you know in the round I'm content with my life and in 2017 I really struggled to find that I really struggled to find that contentment um and and then what happened is I got cross about the fact that I couldn't find it. So it, it kind of added another layer of um, of frustration. So I was already frustrated at my health. I was already frustrated about the impact it was having on on, uh, on my life. I was frustrated about the fact I wasn't able to, to kind of see myself or be the me that I wanted to be. Um, and then there was this this extra layer of frustration that was um, that I was pl- sort of layering in on top. So. So the looking back now on, on what I was doing and how I was doing it almost makes like an interesting case study for me to learn from for the future. Um, because I did, I, I really didn't enjoy that. I didn't enjoy that, that struggling to find that level of contentment to be, to being happy in the round. Um, cause I, I, that's just something that didn't come easily for me at all last year. Um, so why am I sharing all this stuff then is a question that pops into my mind because I, I, I look, I've just looked at the notes that I had for this podcast and everything I've just been saying for the last 12 minutes or so wasn't in on the list of things that I was going to talk about um, for today so why am I sharing all of this stuff I, I guess because one, no that's not true so I'm doing it for a couple of different reasons. One, because one of the things that I want to experiment with on the podcast this year is um, more personal stories. So one of the things, what I loved about the podcast, the podcast episodes throughout 2017 were that we genuinely, I delivered on my promise that I made to myself when I started the podcast. I had a mix of business leaders, practitioners and researchers talking about the role of emotion at work. That could be emotion at work in individuals, emotion at work between people, or emotion at work in culture. And and I absolutely delivered on all of those three fronts last year. But what I, what for me, what was missing, or one of the things that, maybe not missing, but one of the things I'd like to add to that, maybe that's a, there's another reframe for you. One of the things I'd like to add to that is... Um, talking with individuals about some of the emotion at work challenges that they've had well it doesn't necessarily have to be challenges actually it could be successes as well so um occasions where people have had to work with their emotions or work with very emotion rich um situations or scenarios 
So that could be about um, meetings that someone's had to mediate. It could be about um, personal experiences that, that they've had. But I'm really looking to get that that individual perspective in a way like I'm sharing, not like I'm sharing as I am sharing now um, or have been sharing for the last 12 minutes or so talking about experience that they've had how it was for them at the time how they how they look back on it now what that's kind of told them or informed them about their about their practice because i think there's some real value in hearing how other people work with their emotions now i can bring some um you know i can bring then some of the the evidence-based decoding of what's happened whether that be about um how how like me i was struggling with identity and how that works whether it be about um what it could have been that was triggering the particular emotions whether it could have been the or whether it is the the coping mechanisms and the way that people work with their emotions that that's what i can bring to the podcast and i can i can start to um to share some of the 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 reasons or rationales or, or the the research that sits behind what people do but i really want to add that that aspect of what individuals bring so emotion at work in stories I, I put a call out in october on twitter and linkedin to say if you feel you have a a, a personal story that you can share around emotion at work then i want to hear from you and i want to repeat that call now if you're listening to this podcast and and that's something either what i've said over the last and in, in the introduction to this podcast or um if it's trigger something in you to make you think, you know what, I've got a story I want to tell, then I really want to hear from you. Now, I've got the technology to be able to either disguise your voice if you want to, if it wants to be anonymous, or I can get someone else to um, uh, you know, use the voice of an actor type thing. If, if you want it to be anonymous, we can work with that. Um, but also, if, you, if you're happy just to tell your story, then, then I'm, I'm good with that too. Now, I know some people have put their hand up already and said, I want to be involved in that. And if I haven't been in touch with you already, I'll be in touch with you soon so that we can get um, we can get those podcasts recorded. Um, but this, this is something that, that I'm looking to add now. So, so my reasons for sharing my story for 2017, then partly it's as a way to say. I'm willing to get involved in this, too. So that, that's that's part of it. It's a small part of it. For me, the main driver, like I said in my in the blog that I wrote um, during the course of the year, is I don't think this topic is talked about enough. I don't think there are enough people in the world that are saying I struggled and this is how I struggled and this is why I struggled and this is what I did. And if we want to get or if we want to get, I want to get emotion at work, something that we actively talk about, engage and work with. And that's never going to happen if we don't talk about how we feel. So that's what's driving me um, to, to open the podcast in um, in the way that I have. It wasn't my plan, um, but we have, so there we go. All right, so I mentioned uh, that, that I want to uh, add to the podcast format, getting more uh, personal stories involved. There's other things I want to add to the podcast format as well. So um, we're going to have multiple. We will we will have podcasts with multiple guests this year. So there will be podcasts that will come that will have more than two voices on. So every podcast last year, apart from one, uh, and even then it was part of one, um, only had two voices on. So what I want to do um, in 2018 is to get more voices on the podcast. So um we will have podcasts with multiple guests which i think is going to be a challenge of my hosting duties so as as a host when there's only one other person to talk with actually you're more of just a conversation partner than you are uh, a host whereas if we've got multiple voices on then i, I think that's going to challenge my hosting duties so I, i'm looking forward to that challenge uh, also um we're going to be doing some live podcasts so we are going to do two live podcasts this year. I've just decided we're going to do two live podcasts. Um, I was going to say, I don't know how many we're going to do, but we're going to do two. Uh, when we're going to do them, I don't know. Or where we're going to do them, I don't know. But there will be two live podcasts this year. So if you want to be part of the audience for a live podcast, then I will put a link to um, somewhere. I don't know what it will be because I've just made it up. Uh, we'll put a link in the show notes to somewhere you can go to register your interest for 
uh, taking part in a or being interested in coming along to a live Emotion at Work podcast. Um, also, uh, what else are we going to do? So let me get my list back so I can make sure I'm clear. So yeah, we're going to do um, multiple guests, personal stories, live podcasts, but also um, all the guests that I've had on so far um, have either been talking about things that they've done, whether that be research or kind of work and activity, um, or talking about existing kind of theories and concepts. So the other thing I want to do is have more exploratory discussions and conversations. So where we've got practitioners or researchers coming together to talk about ideas or concepts or um, notions that people are positing for the first time. So it will be more of a, like an embryonic discussion rather than a this is what I did and this is how I did it. It's going to be much more of an embryonic discussion in the first podcast recording that we've got lined up uh, after this one is with um, Nick Shackleton Jones and Suk Pabial where we're talking about um, Nick's created a new kind of model for uh, how we think about memory and learning called the effective context model and we're going to talk about that um, or myself and Suk and Nick are going to explore that as part of the first podcast so it's much more of a uh, an exploratory discussion so that's something that uh, we'll look to do more of through the course of um, of 2018. Finally then in terms of uh, how else of experimenting with podcast format is we're going to get some old guests back on so Sarah Jane Lenny is already lined up so SJ was our first ever official guest so on episode two SJ and I talked about her research in the police force in Greater Manchester Police Force so she's now a year a year on from her research that we talked about then so I'm really interested in in hearing from SJ especially about uh, how her research has moved on over the course of that year. So we're going to revisit some old guests and see um, where they're, what they're up to now and, and how things have progressed for them since we spoke last. So with all of that, my request is going to be for you to let me know how these experiments go. So if you think the additions to the podcast format are working brilliantly, then can you tell me? If you think the additions or the changes to the podcast format actually are making it worse, then please can you tell me? So throughout these experiments, the only way I'm going to know if, well not the only way because that's not quite true, one of the ways I can know um, if they're working or not is for you, the audience, to tell me. I can look at things like download numbers and uh, interactions on Twitter and shares and likes and comments and those sorts of things. But what I'd really like is to, to get some feedback from you uh, as to what you think as to how the podcast format evolves and changes um, over the course of the year. Um, uh, what else am I up to then? What else am I looking forward to this year? So I'm, I'm looking forward to doing more with Emotion at Work. You know, Emotion at Work is something that came into being uh, formally uh, last year in, in 2017 and I'm looking forward to to doing more with, uh, with Emotion at Work both within the podcast but also um, as a business as a whole. The, already we've got work happening where I'm doing some consultancy work on some talent programs. Uh, I'm getting involved in, in additional research into the way that uh, people negotiate credibility and, and negotiate their identity in the workplace. Um, I've got some really interesting work where uh, I'm coding some videos to do some behavioral analysis work to see uh, what are people saying um, and how does that relate to what, they're, uh, what they might actually be thinking and feeling. Um, so I've got a real variety of uh, of work coming up over the course of the year as well. So uh, I'm excited for 2018, um, both from a personal health and well-being point of view, um, but also from a uh, of what the future of the podcast is going to look like, and also what the future of of my work will look like too. So before I close off this um, this episode of the podcast, then I just want to say some thank yous. So first of all, I want to start with a huge thank you to Simon Leverton. So Simon um, edits this podcast for me. So he doesn't have, um, you know, we one of the things I said about the podcast from the early days is that what you get to hear is unedited. So we don't kind of chop bits in and out or move bits around or uh, or splice between guests. One thing that we hold on to is what you get to hear is the, is the natural conversation that occurred. Um, but in terms of helping fix my audio... Uh, quality issues in terms of making sure that the the levels are set appropriately 
in terms of topping and tailing the podcast for me and just making sure that it's of the the best audio quality it can be so a huge thank you to to simon for for the work he does in, in editing the podcast uh, also a huge thank you to ross garner um who's at ross garner gp on twitter um ross has been instrumental uh, in in helping me put the emotional world podcast together the learnings that he shared with me from his experiences both with his own podcast and with the good practice podcast has been just exceptionally helpful so i, I wouldn't be where i am without all your help ross so um so thank you very much i'm, I'm exceptionally grateful um also want to say thank you to simon heath because there was one uh, podcast in particular where um i'd made some huge errors with my uh, audio recording and um simon's had a, a friend who works in a music studio that managed to work some magic to to get the audio quality uh, up so uh, thank you mr heath for for your support over the course of the year as well uh, also huge thank you to all of our guests um I never thought I would enjoy interviewing all of you as much as I have. It's been a, a thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyable, educational and informative experience. So thank you so much to uh, to all of the guests that we've had on the podcast. And then most of all, thank you very much to you, fair listener, as I've called you a number of times over the course of the year. Um, to, to have a podcast that is being uh, downloaded, accessed and listened to as regularly as, as this one is is um, it, it blows my mind really um, and, and I'm just really pleased and really proud that you like what I'm doing that you like the content that is something that you're finding useful and engaging and and I, you know, the, the messages that I get from 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 you that tell me how helpful and useful um, certain episodes or or the podcast as a whole have been um, all mean an awful lot so thank you very much I wasn't sure whether this podcast would be any good or if it would be um a bag of shit but it seems as though it's going well so i'm uh, i'm incredibly pleased that that's the case so thank you very much fair listener both for listening to the podcast so far over the course of uh, 2017 uh, i'm really excited about what the podcast is going to bring for 2018 um we've got some really great guests lined up already i mentioned nick and suk also we've got professor carrie cooper who's the president of the cipd um, we've got a recording with him lined up. Uh, we've got Sarah Taylor, um, who's doing some really, really interesting work, research into work and research into social care. Um, so there are some really exciting uh, podcast episodes that are coming your way. So without further ado, I'll say thank you very much for listening. Um, the next podcast will be out um, a week. No, where will it be out? The next podcast will be out on the 18th of January. So you can hear from Nick Sack, Shackleton Jones and Sip Pabell on the 18th of January. And then episodes will follow uh, fortnightly after that. So once again, thanks very much. Thanks for listening. And here's to an amazing 2018. You've been listening to the Emotion at Work podcast. Written, recorded and presented by Phil Wilcox. Edited together by Simon Leverton. You can find more information at emotionatwork.co.uk or follow us on Twitter at, at Phil Wilcox. Thanks for listening.